going by the knob here. It's delayed. That's delayed? That is. Oh. Mm -hmm. there she is. Okay, we are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to everybody um, to the Indian River County Hospital District regular monthly meeting in the month of November already. Amazing. Um, we have with us tonight Pastor Derek West to give us the invocation. Pastor. Madam Chair, I must confess this evening or this afternoon that my the flag of my heart flies at half mast for the loss of my friend and my colleague Roger Ball, and I kindly ask that we take a moment of silence for his memory. Lord, may Roger's spirit of servitude and love for the community be our example. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. We didn't know him well at the district, but he uh, had a great impact, and what he did with Dynamic Life and all that is truly something. So thank you for, for doing that. Um, if you will join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If I could get a motion for approval of the chairman's meeting minutes dated October 20th, the regular monthly meeting minutes dated October 21st, and a November disbursement of Mr. Jones. Uh, $807,355 and two cents. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, we have with us tonight Karen Campbell. Karen, if you'd like to come up from Healthy Start. We just found out we knew each other for yeah. a long time ago. <laughs> uh, Andrea's not here. I know she wanted to give you guys a little bit of an update on some things that are going on, so hopefully she'll catch up. But I just wanted, you have a letter from me, which I we forgot do. to bring, so I won't read it to you. Um, I just wanted to come in person and thank you all for, oh, good timing. <laughs> thank you for your support of Healthy Start. Um, these have been tough times, and I think our programs and um, our organizations making a big difference. We could never do it without the support of the hospital district. So I just wanted to make sure you appreciated from our board and from our staff how much we value your partnership and how much we how grateful we are for your support and for everything you do in the community not just for us but for everyone in our community so with that andrea is going to give you some exciting news on what's happening okay hello everyone hi andrea sorry i was running in um so karen already said thank you but i'll say thank you again um and also um I wanted to make sure that you knew about an investment that you made that's making a huge difference. You guys were the, one of the first people to fund our community doula program that you know has been very effective in our county of um, helping to improve birth outcomes, lowering cesarean rate, preterm birth, low birth weight. And this morning, our state entity voted to take that program statewide. Awesome. Awesome. So the model that we created here will now be duplicated all across the state. And that's because of you guys. So pat yourselves on the back. Thank you so much. Congratulations. That's exciting. Congratulations. And exciting news. Thank you. Hey, Andrea, I think you have to tell them about the. Oh. <laughs> and the other part of that is because the model has been so well recognized, um, actually Anthem Foundation, which is the national health care insurance company, invited us to apply for a um, grant to fund that expansion statewide. So they are currently looking at it, but um, being invited in itself is, is, um, is a kudos to us. And um, they also, one of their um, under, um, umbrella, under their umbrella is Simply Healthcare, their local Medicaid uh, management organization. They, um, at our 30 year anniversary last week, which thank you all for some of you guys for coming, um, presented us with a check for $30,000 to help us with this expansion as well. Yes. So that's the first drop, but it could mean um, they fund the whole expansion. That's awesome. Congratulations awesome. on that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Keep up the good work. Great. 
You guys continue to do great work here and taking care of those mommies and babies. <laughs> I always hear your voice when I hear about mommies and babies. <laughs> it's a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, okay, council report. Jennifer. Thank you. Um, been another busy month. We've responded to your questions as they've arisen, uh, members of the Board of Trustees. Continuing to review the annual deadlines and deliverables due under the lease um, to ensure that we get the proper report outs uh, from the hospital, which will be upcoming. Um, also continuing to work on the matter with the hospital and the VNA's council with regard to our existing agreements and some changes that we're trying to make to those. And also working on um, potentially an ordinance change with the county regarding the stormwater retention and how that may impact the Indian River County floodplain and stormwater code changes as it relates to the property that the hospital sits on and of course the district owns. Um, so we're watching that and there may be another meeting coming forth next month on that after which I'll have more information for you. And of course as a board you've recently just completed your annual compensation committee tasks this past month. Um, any other questions for me at this time? No, I don't think so. Okay, our financial review. This will be brief because it's uh, early in the year. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, the district remains in uh, sound financial condition. In fact, I'd even use the word solid. Uh, we have cash and in investments of $5.7 million as of October 31st. So we just spent 800,000 of it. So as we enter November, we'll have just under $4.9 million. Of course, we have some expenses in November, but historically, Indian River County residents are very prompt in paying their taxes. <laughs> so we would expect to have a healthy surge in cash deposits by the end of November. Next month, we'll accelerate our focus on our strategic vision. And whatever direction we decide is appropriate for our support, we're likely to have sufficient funding to accommodate it. That's it. And we Can't look, get any better. And we look forward to that, helping out. Incidentally, that's even after a millage reduction. So. <laughs> Especially after a millage reduction. <laughs> okay. okay, it took us a while to get there, but we got there, didn't we? Um, okay, Executive Director Report, Anne-Marie. Okay, um, I think I know you did not have a written report in your um, packet this month, and I'm not sure how I overlooked that, but I did, so I'll give you it in verbal form. Um, as you know, we worked on the strategic plan, has been, I've been working with Carter closely, um, so I continue to do that this month, and, and I think we'll have some good things coming out of that um, for the, in our in our retreat or when that happens. Um, I should have started first with introducing Dawn Carboni. I know I introduced her to you for uh, at the chairman's meeting, but for those on our public that have not yet met her, she is our newest employee and has been here for almost, uh, tomorrow will be four weeks, I think, four weeks with us. So I, she has is getting herself familiar, so you'll be seeing her as we make our tour around to the organizations and um, so that she can become more familiar with the programming and, and funding that we do. Um, the uh, Mental Health Visioning Committee is um, going to meet at the end of the month again or reconvene again at the end of the month. Um, we had a really great report from uh, Carissa Bolden on the IOP program that was born out of that work of that committee and, and community partners. Um, we are looking to embark on trying to fill the gap for detox in our community um, so that people don't have to go outside of this community. So that will help bridge, I think, a continuum of care that we have not had in Indian River County. So that's going to be our next task. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, working diligently on our annual report as we have put out the last two Decembers, um, the last two years. So look forward to that coming your way about mid-December or so. So we're just completing that and we'll have that printed um, for distribution at the middle of the month. I think those are the 
highlights, if, unless there are other questions for me. There was a question yesterday about where the retreat is going to be held. There was a question about that? There was. Do okay. You know? <laughs> it will be held at the um, Quail River Club. Okay. River. Is that what it's Boat called? Boathouse. Boathouse. Boat Boathouse. I'm sorry. Of the Quail, Ru of Quail, Quail Valley, Valley, Valley River, River Club, Club mm -hmm. Boathouse. Yeah. Okay. Is where it will be. Good. Yes. Good. We're looking forward to that. That's a. Okay. It's going to be exciting. Okay. Any other questions for Emory? Hearing none, we will move into our funded agencies. Um, so, Pedro, welcome back. I've never actually used one of these before, so you have to. <laughs> Got it. Well, you can put the first slide. Uh, good evening. Uh, this past year has been a uh, year for challenge, learning, and uh, trying to figure out how to bring information, how to uh, continue to work doing what we're doing, and also collaborating with everyone so everything will be more clear. Um, I took, I started uh, my graduate program this summer, and it's very uh, heavy on research, and uh, uh, one of the things that I recently started taking over is those statistics part of our program that hopefully we'll be able to, to add more to what we have today and continue to bring those uh, clear resources going forward. Um, so one of the things that we you know, just a brief thing, uh, we are um, listed on the SAMHSA website for mental health and substance abuse. Uh, a lot of you, uh, some of you have asked me about our team or who worked with us. So I did uh, put some pictures of some, uh, most of, of our employees. On the top uh, left-hand side is Daniel. He's our CEO. And on the far right-hand side, it's uh, Ricardo Lazo. He's our CFO. Uh, both of them have different businesses in the county, and they work, uh, so they kind of help me. Uh, with this uh, right in between myself and Ricardo is Dr. Bishop. He's our medical director, and uh, he is uh, an addictionologist uh, uh, and also uh, very, uh, very involved into our program and knows what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, on the other side, next to Misty, which you already know, she's back there, uh, is David Gibbs. He's our clinical director. Uh, Dr. Gibbs, and he uh, helps us with all the clinical side and on the behavioral part of Phoenix Rising. Uh, and then uh, the rest are supported staff. Uh, the one all the way below, Dr. Bishop, uh, her name is Sharon, and she's our psychiatric mm -hmm. person that sees our clients. Uh, some of the things that we do, uh, I wanted to kind of like map out our intake process. So we do the pre-admission. This is where we determine where our clients go to detox, come to us, or that they need anything else uh, uh, before they get to us. If they have, are um, with uh, law enforcement, what, it, what they need before they come to us. Uh, then we have our partial hospitalization, which you already know uh, the rest of, of that part. The alumni is what we have continuously worked on uh, after people graduate from our program to stay connected within uh, our own community in case there is a relapse we are able, or before they, they relapse, we're able to work with them in order for them to remain sober. Uh, so these are some of the completions that we did last year for hospital district, uh, 36 PHP. Uh, IOP is 20, and at that point, at the end of September, we had nine applicants and uh, for PHP level of care and uh, for pending completions. Uh, so this is what uh, the numbers look for the year. 88% uh, of all of our clients uh, remain sober after 30 days, uh, and it reduces uh, 
over time. However, the number remains, uh, you know, above our 75% over time. We uh, don't have full numbers on the year parts of it, but it is, uh, uh, we can have that uh, later on uh, about who, how many of them do remain sober for, for a year or more. Uh, so uh, out of, we started doing this late in the year, uh, the client satisfaction survey. Uh, the pre-admission process is where we fall a little bit short. Uh, one of the things that they said is that the program is not well explained at the beginning, uh, where we need to work, and this is what we're seeing. Uh, we need to spend more time with them and the family and, and really detail more. Uh, however, after they start the uh, admission process and they start into medication and substance abuse education, uh, it really bumps to 92%. Strongly agree that they get what they need out of the program, uh, while 77.3% 7 uh, just agree. We don't have any dislikes there, so I think we're, we're, we're good on that. We're, we're trying to continue to improve. Uh, and I feel like this, uh, doing this, uh, really uh, see where we fall short, that we can continue to work towards a more uh, successful uh, treatment. Uh, same thing goes for uh, the treatment planning. This is the time that they spend with their uh, therapist as far as whether they feel that they are um, participating actively in their treatment process. Uh, if they, that they are, uh, that they have a say in what they, they, they need to do and, and they seem to uh, be very strong uh, about that, strong belief that they are part of it. Uh, the environment of safety when it comes to cleanliness of the place, making sure that everything, you know, is well, their transportation, that they feel safe with COVID, uh, making sure that everybody still wears a mask while they're in the, tra in, in the transportation van. Uh, they feel uh, very strong that uh, we do keep it safe. And then lastly, the quality of care, uh, making sure that, you know, we, we are giving them what they need and, and giving them the services that they will need afterwards. Uh, really has helped us. So there's a few uh, room for improvement, uh, but we are working and, and getting those uh, numbers. Uh, what is new, we are now in network with TRICARE. And for those of you who may not be uh, so, uh, or know what it is, is uh, for veterans that uh, from military, and if they are on active duty, as long as they have a primary care pro, uh, provider referral, then we can take them in. So we just uh, started taking those. Uh, we became uh, in network with them about a month and a half ago. Good. So uh, we That's are good. trying to do more work with our veterans, uh, more work with, uh, uh, we started reaching out to different people in the area. And before uh, us, they were, nobody else would take TRICARE uh, in the county. And uh, so they were all going outside for services. Uh, so we're trying to, to really uh, facilitate that and, and make it easier for our veterans to, uh, to come in and, and take, uh, get services for uh, substance abuse. What's uh, future near plan, uh, uh, what we're working on on the, on the left hand side is all the people, all the insurances that we are um, going in, in network with. And right now, we are in the process of credentialing. So we're trying to make it easier, not just for people that don't that have those PPO plans, but everybody that comes along. After those, uh, we are trying to go for uh, Medicaid and Medicare. So we are slowly uh, moving towards that, where we are able to serve more people in our community. Um, also, uh, hoping and I'm really, really pleased. And we will have uh, 24 additional beds for those uh, females and males coming up uh, by the middle of uh, December. Uh, that's our hope. We're, we're working, we're so close on, on finishing that project. And uh, there, uh, we, there's only one female house in Indian River County, and that's the one we have with only eight beds. So there's nothing else right now. And, we're trying to figure out how to facilitate for more people in, in the community to, to have access to that. Uh, finally, uh, we, are, we, are, we have an inpatient residential, but due to the lack of housing, we haven't been able to open it. 
again, we did all the sprinklers inside, everything, it's ready to go, but there's no housing, which is why we need the additional beds. Um, we just went to look at a, a facility that is licensed for 24 beds yesterday, um, hoping to make an offer on that by after Thanksgiving, and uh, hoping to do uh, detox and residential by uh, January, February. Mm -hmm. uh, so trying to uh, work on that. It, once we become in network with all these insurances, it will be a lot easier to just uh, do in network with the upper levels of care as well. And um, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. You've come a long way, Pedro. Boy, I have to tell you. <laughs> I know we haven't always been easy on you, okay? Um, but I, I think it's all important what you have, your statistics that you're working on, and, and it, it helps you improve your, what you're doing as well. So we do support you, okay? And we'll just keep pushing. <laughs> I, I, what, whatever has happened here has really helped me look at what we're doing and how we're doing. So I really appreciate the feedback. Uh, I, I think that overall it, it will be better. Uh, and I, I, it is my uh, thing that, that this is, is good. And, and the more information we have, the, the better we can, we can make it. I'd like to ask you a question though. Uh, you said you, in the future, would be able to measure how many people remain sober after a year. Yes. How are you going to go about uh, getting that data? We have uh, Misty and her team uh, usually keep in touch with them through our, our alumni program. So uh, we still in contact with those that we started three years, uh, three and a half years ago with us. So there are some that are two plus years sober. So we are now trying to collect that data as we speak. Some of them may fall, so there might be some zeros on it, but I'm, I, I, I think that we can have a somewhat accurate. Uh, yeah. So you think staying in touch with them beyond the program is yes. important? Mm -hmm. It, it makes sense to yes. me. Thank you. Pedro, I have a question. It, did I understand you to say that uh, you have a very soft voice? My apologies. As, a, as oh. opposed to my very loud New Jersey voice. But um, did I understand you to say that if you, if, the, if you are able to get the additional 24 beds, this, this home for 24 beds, that you would be able to start, perhaps think about the detox center within? Is that what I heard you say? Yes, that is the plan. Uh, yeah. of, that is actually the only reason why we're looking at, at this uh, facility, uh -huh. is to do detox. and residence. Detox, mm -hmm. which would be wonderful. It's, it's one of our, yes. uh, we're really going to concentrate on making sure that happens in the community, very needed. Thank you. So do you know, I mean, if you get this facility, um, which I'm hoping that you do get the facility, but if you get it, do you, what is your likely occupancy? I mean, right away, I, would you think you will fill it? I would say that when we had the residential inpatient, which comes right after detox, uh, we had a full uh, at six beds, so I'm thinking that it will be mostly full with the 24, yes. I bet it will be, yeah. <laughs> Other questions for Pedro? No, oh, good luck. <laughs> thank, yeah, you. thank you. And thank you, very good presentation. Thank you. Child care resources, Shannon. And Tracy, welcome back. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having us here and allowing us to give an update to you about our wellness and early intervention program. We are incredibly proud of this uh, program, which came to be because of all of you, and it continues to grow. Um, so we're so thankful. Um, Tracy Griffiths, who directs the program, is behind me, and Terry Beard, our school director, so they're the boots on the ground. So I'm going to let them share um, some um, information, and then um, they're going to share with you a story, actually, that just happened uh, about a week and a half ago with one of our 
families. I think one of the most beneficial parts of this program being um, added to the Child Care Resources Program is the uh, relationships that have been strengthened with our parents because of the health component. And so because of that, we're seeing um, just some amazing um, success stories with our families. And um, so I'll let you let them share a little bit, and then I'll be here to answer any questions too. Hi there. Uh, I feel like we were just here. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you were. And much, much, right, much of what is on that report is kind of the closeout. There are a few things that completed in that. Um, the story that Shannon is talking about, as you know, um, it's been almost five years since we started our program, and it was just me. Um, at that time, we've added a wellness coordinator, we added a child life specialist, and we added a case manager also within the past six months. Um, so again, as Shannon said, you know, it's all about the relationships. I've known a lot of these families since the kids were babies and just meeting with them year after year. Tara and I talk to them every day. Um, and, and our teachers are super, super involved. And so we had a situation where um, a couple of teachers came to us and said, you know, we're concerned. We have a couple of girls and they're acting not right. Um, some behavior stuff and really some really strong emotions. Um, and so Tara and I reached out to mom and took us a few times. She didn't call back. Um, I finally got through to her and she divulged quite a bit of information. Um, there was a divorce in the works. There was um, some unsafe things happening in the home. And she was struggling because she needed to get out of the house um, and she only had a certain amount of time. She had kind of a minimal budget of what she could afford. So we talked through some options, um, who she could call, where she might have luck, um, made some referrals for um, her, for the, girl, for the girls, for types and teens, and some um, mental health services. Um, so within, I connected her with our case manager, and within about 48 hours, we had her out of the house, um, moved in over a weekend, um, helped her get beds, pillows, everything um, to start from scratch. So um, we are working with her, getting her what she needs, getting her kind of taken care of for Christmas and that kind of thing. So it really goes back to just um, the need for the relationship and that continuity of talking to them and keeping lines of communication open. So um, I think it's just kind of one of those situations where you kind of see how our program has grown um, and how it really has impacted lives a lot. I mean, we've had a great deal of mental health issues over the past, I mean, we're really seeing a lot right now. Um, we have several divorces going on and that's hard for these kids and we have the child life specialist there to, to help um, and, and really um, parent support, child support, um, all of it. So it really is, is interesting to watch it grow and it's kind of amazing and that kind of brought it together for us. So, and that's thanks to you guys. So um, the other thing that we will be doing I will be doing um, and I hate presenting things but I am going to be doing um, a um, presentation for our director we do a director's what's it called a director's cafe, cafe. It's, a director, it's a director's network for all of the yes. um, early childhood educator directors in the county so um, we are actually going to share our model of early intervention what we do the relationships that we form with our families and kind of how we approach things um, to hopefully kind of share that I mean not everybody can have a nurse not everybody can have um, all of these resources, but there are things that they can do to kind of model a little bit of what we're doing to get these kids ready to go to kindergarten. So, um, it's exciting. Yeah. How old were these girls? They are three and five. Oh. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, that's congratulations on that. And yep. To build the, <laughs> the relationship with the family that they are confident enough to share because that's that is you know they're very vulnerable to share that kind of information and then to accept the help mm -hmm. because that's it's also a very scary situation to to be moving out and within 48 hours so I give you all a lot of credit for for doing that and I assume that you work with a lot of other organizations to make it happen so what a great collaboration yes. um, it speaks well for the community it does it we had a lot of our case manager is a bulldog and she will <laughs> She Good. will make any phone call, and so she really has worked really, really hard, and she worked all weekend getting her where she needed to be and, and what needed to happen. So 
it was it was a great situation and, and but a good for day. the teachers to recognize uh, a problem yes. and that's what have we somebody I mean, to go to to be able so to follow up right mm -hmm. I think the um, it's a testament to the amount of trauma-informed care training that we've been able to participate in which we did with Tyson teens mm -hmm. and then through the Department of Children and Families um, it really has helped the teachers tune in to you know what's developmentally appropriate and average and then what are those key factors that we're really looking for and how we can support one another um, so and it really did start with the teacher saying you know this child is doing this hey can you come take a look to us to Tracy to the case manager it just honestly it couldn't have been more holistic and just really it wrapped around everyone Which, Thank good case study that's really good yeah. mm -hmm. and without the support she would she would not be out of the house she but you gave her the confidence in your support and it's always nice to have someone around you to just give you the confidence and uh, be able to rely on somebody else so thank you very much I think you guys are a good uh, case study for us as well though yeah. because yep um, yeah, I remember when you came in the discussion, what is a, ch a yeah, child yeah. care, I'm sure you do, Shannon, <laughs> and what is a child care, you know, group coming and asking for, for money from the hospital district for health care, and I mean, they, I remember we had quite a debate, and we did. yes, and you held your ground, I would say, but um, it's a good case study for us that, you know, um, it can be anywhere um, that we need to help with uh, with the health of the children and, and grown-ups and everything else. So thank you for, uh, I guess, <coughs> opening our eyes as well. Yep. Any other? May I ask a question? Um, in the report, I was really interested with the vision and hearing screenings. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about the six kids who had been referred to pediatricians. All six received glasses or some sort of well, or didn't need glasses, or what, what was the outcome? Yeah, so um, with the vision, it, we always luck out. Sometimes it's precautionary, and there are so many developmental things that kids, you know, while, while some things do trigger, mm -hmm. it's a developmental thing. Um, a lot of it ends up with tubes in their ears, ah. um, and so it's always hard, and it gets it, it's so much easier now that I have the equipment that you guys funded for us because – now I know that if you fail, I can go back 12 other times and, and check them because chances are they're stuffy or they're whatever. So, um, but it, it usually, especially with this age, is the ears. So, yeah. So it was, those were more hearing than they were vision? Yes. Okay. Well, yes. I think one child failed okay. vision, maybe. Okay. Um, but like I said, some of that is developmental. Yeah. So. I was just interested if they did get glasses, what, what have you seen incrementally in their learning because mm -hmm. obviously if you can't read because you can't see right um yeah. so I was, that's we have I one was little one with that. glasses um and um yeah she she's had some struggles over the yeah. course of time that are correcting for sure thank you mm -hmm. thank you you know it seems everything's interrelated particularly with these young kids as they grow up and you're at least with us working mainly on wellness and you've got these developmental milestones but do you how many children do you have under your care right now is about 150 is that the right number we have 158 158 mm -hmm. and do you get into education at all teaching them to read or anything like that um you know i guess that's me <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um so absolutely we have curriculum for all of our children starting at six weeks when they're allowed when they can enter the program all the way through that year, that pre-kindergarten year. And so we work very hard to meet those academic, social, emotional milestones. Um, so what we are constantly looking at what's expected in kindergarten, how we can meet that, to make sure that everything we're doing from that six week mark is preparing them to enter kindergarten because it's scaffolded, it builds on each other. If you're doing things successfully at six weeks, then odds are you're successful at two years and so on and so forth so that they're better prepared and rolling into kindergarten. Okay. And, um, and again, there's a curriculum from that moment until the end. So we've integrated everything we could. We, um, 
We follow the state of Florida standards in addition to NACI, the National Association for the Education of Young Children, um, which is a nationally accredited yeah. early childhood gold standard. Um, so we're doing all that we can on every level. And social emotional has been huge, you know, that focus on if you are safe. For example, with those two girls, there was not a lot of learning happening yeah. because they felt so unstable. So now with that stability, they can grow, so. And do you have a waiting list? Of, uh, That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, we, we have always have a wait list. It's about 250 children. Uh, two more than you have. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, up, it goes up and down. But is that because you don't have enough personnel and the place to put them? Yes. Yeah. So there's yeah. room for expansion. We're, we're almost maxed out in, um, in our building right now. And, um, and then our contracting centers are, are the, the number of spots that we have is all that they're able to give us. And what about the funding, though, for it? Too? It's funding, yeah. There is funding for it? Well, there, there, it, I'm sorry, what was your question? Is there funding for the 250? If you had capacity, could you, do you have funding to bring in the? And it, our, our cost per child is just over about $12,000 a year. So we would have to do additional fundraising, but the families that we assist, there is not state or uh, federal fund, um, funds available today um, for those children. It's something we are watching at the federal level because things are changing. Um, there is some talk that there might be some subsidies available, but until it's all the dust settles up there. <laughs> but so right now today- It has to be paid by the, by the families or through scholarships through you. Right, we, um, our families pay between 15 and 30% of the total cost okay. of care. So, um, and the rest comes from philanthropy. Uh, well, can, can you expand a little bit further? Out of your funding, how much is philanthropy? How much is federal mm -hmm. government? I didn't know you got federal government. The only federal government money we receive is um, they were reimbursed for our food program. So that's the only federal funding we receive. Um, we receive a little bit of state money for our four-year-old children um, through the VPK program. We receive $2,300 a year per child um, from the state for our four-year-olds. And there's a tiny um, other um, state funding stream we're able to access uh, for about seven additional children. The rest all comes from philanthropy. We have a $2.5 million operating budget. Our parents pay about $300,000 in tuition a year. So that's our only earned income and everything else is raised. The grants and individuals. So what, what percentage of that's philanthropy? Two thirds or? Oh, percentages. Um, <laughs> the majority of it well, is how much is it? Yes, the, 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 the vast majority. Thousand to calculate. No, I got that part. Yes. No, that's so the that's the family's is, pay. Yeah. That's the family's pay. I'm talking the about the philanthropy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Almost no, two million dollars is being raised in the community I'm each sorry? year. Over two million dollars we have. Two million. Raise. Yes. So you have a total of two and a half. I do have a percentage I can give you. I just yeah, well, that's 80 percent, right? Not there. remembering. So it. you have a very busy okay. board of directors raising money for you or helping? Yes, we have a fantastic board of directors. Good. We have Good. a really wonderful um, donor base that Good. we are so grateful for, and we have a great retention rate, right. and we're always hoping to attract new donors. So <laughs> right. feel, for, feel free to tell a friend that you about the story you heard today, and um, the. Um, the, our program runs on philanthropy. We right. are, that's, that's how we, we're- As so many programs do yep. run and, on philanthropy. And it's, it's unique our, um, because the families that we serve, there, there aren't those dollars available today. So right. I don't exactly. know what's gonna happen tomorrow. I'm right. watching every single day. Well, I'm thinking of those 250 children yeah. mm -hmm. that are out there like dangling participles yeah. waiting and, to and be taken. Board of Directors is moving into some strategic planning and yeah. uh, you know expansion is something we are always talking about. Um, right. You know we did a, quite an expansion five years ago um, so we just yes. you know kind of finalizing all of those pledge payments and so now we're looking at what happens next. Never stops. It never ends. I, was say, I think when we first met you had about 75 children yeah. at the facility so I mean you've over doubled right already yeah. so. it's a great program mm -hmm. so we continue to try to find ways to add children as much as we can but we need more space yeah. there you go somebody's out there willing to give you some space I know mm -hmm. all right <laughs> Anne Marie said <laughs> absolutely Anne Marie said Anne Marie said it's in the minutes <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> thank you okay. we appreciate thank it. you
Yeah, thank you. And now we have New Horizons. Thank you for all you do at Child Care Resources and for taking care of the kids. Welcome. Welcome. Hello. I'm William Williams, the CEO at New Horizons, and this is Robin Kirby, our COO at New Horizons. Hello. Um, <laughs> it's my first time here. I'm a little nervous, but um, I've been at New Horizons for a little over 20 years. Um, I served there, um, started out their IT computer department years ago, the MIS department, and I moved on to the electronic health records quality improvement and became the CIO. I worked under John Romano for many years there. Um, I've attended Inouye and Marie, and I've attended a few of the, uh, the meetings in the past on data issues and whatnot. And uh, a few months ago, I was promoted to COO. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. It's very challenging, especially during these times. <laughs> uh, so, and uh, William, William came on board as well as the CEO. So we've had quite, quite a lot of challenge and transition you know, over the past few years between leadership and COVID. So we're really, really hoping to move forward, get um, the right, right people in the right positions and um, work with our board of directors on new strategic initiatives and move forward and do what we can to help our clients. Well, mine's not as lengthy as uh, Robin's because I've been here 11 months as of yesterday, so. <laughs> <laughs> but. Thank you for all that you do for us and help support us. A um, couple of numbers that I have for you from October 1, 2020 through September the 30th, 2021, we have served 1,575 residents in Indian River. We had uh, 1,370 adults, 205 children. Actually, in our report, we have it broke down as far as the ages. One of our um, surprising things as far as ages for us, this past six months, we've had an uptake on age six to 11 Amazing. as far as the kids, and we had an uptake in adults age 46 to 64, but we are working on that. In our breakdown, we have had 725, 26 males and 849 females. We are providing services, outpatient therapy, case management, psychiatric services, including psych evals, treatment plans, biopsychosocials, and med medication management. We have a couple of things. To date, right now, we have billed the hospital district $55,234. Right now, we are as far as our outcomes and our metrics, I think we're doing pretty good because right now our people that we are serving, we're keeping them out of the hospitals in, our, in, in your county on an average of 358 days per year. The national average is only 350. So we're doing a good job with the services that we're providing, keeping them out of the hospital, keeping them from out of the jail, keeping them from tying up a lot of services in Indian River. Um, our case management is doing very well. We are hitting right now 95% of our residents that are getting, or your residents that are getting case management services are not requiring inpatient psychiatric hospitalization. We are running right now to 84% of the people that we have surveyed, saying that they are happy with the services and the overall experiences that they're having. New clients are being seen within four days of admission into the program. 90% um, of them said they're happy with the services and people responding to the survey, both the kids and the adults, 96% of them are saying that they are happy with the services. Challenges? Oh, we definitely have some challenges. First challenge is COVID. Um, that's tremendously affected us. We did we didn't lose the doctor that we had in um, Indian River, but we did have to move her because the numbers went down as far as services needed. So we moved her to our St. Lucie office. Now, of course, 
as I said earlier, now the numbers are starting to go up. So now we're finding a doctor to come up to actually be here to be actually in the area. But what we have done for the people who are on uptake or in need of services, we offer telehealth services at our office here at Vero. So they come in and they can still see the same doctor. So they're happy they can still see their doctor via telehealth. But we understand and we know we need a doctor actually in the building in Indian River. We are working on that. But good old COVID has um, gave me a lot of um, obstacles to overturn because trying to find a psychiatrist who deals with kids right now, it's not impossible, but it's been a very huge challenge. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We've tried to do local tenants. We put ads in as far out to Miami, from Gainesville to Miami, and I think we had two applications. Three. Yeah, three. So that, that's what we had, and it's it's just sad right now. But we're, we're up for the challenge, and we're doing um, the best that we can. I do want to tell you, I know the last time I was here, I asked you guys for um, a some of the money that we were not using or we were not billing to, to, to give to our PSR program, since that our PSR program has taken off, we have now serving 54 clients and we've been able to give them 3,910 services before they were half that. So that's been a, a good break for us and that's been through the help of you guys actually letting us move that money over so people are learning to do basic things, take care of themselves, learn how to cook, not full course meals, but at least cook. And the kids that are coming to the program, now that COVID's kind of lessened down, they're actually coming and they're learning job functions and things that they need to learn. So that's been a help. Thank you guys for giving us that opportunity to move that over. And like I said, we, we are drastically improved on the amount of services that we're given as far as that PSR program. Do you have a wait list? Yes, we do, but our wait list is actually for ch for children is the most right now. I think we have about 15 right now, which is not drastic. We're now booking out until the end of December, and that's because we were just down a, site, a children's site. But as we get cancellations, we move them up. Those are Indian River counties. Indian Rivers, yes. Could I? Yes. Yeah, could I ask a question about the locum tenants? Are you looking for a full-time pediatric or child psychiatrist or just locum tenants? We are actually are looking for full-time because the number in Indian River has come up to yeah. where we feel that we now need a full-time. Okay, so advertising, if a psychiatrist would like to come to Florida, is there a reciprocity there or do they have to go through the whole rigmarole of being, you know, being... We, we, we have people in Tallahassee fighting for that to let Yeah, them I think down. they're trying very hard so that we can get people down and they don't have to go through that whole it rigmarole. Hasn't happened yet, but we're hopeful through one of these sessions that will actually go through so we'll be able to do it, but yeah. right now. But not right do now. They have to go through. They, they have to be, they have to have uh, their certification Recertify. here in, they have to be so recertified. They have to be licensed here. They have to be licensed here. They, they might have to go through the exam and right. all the rest of it, unless they originally applied uh, for, for different states when they got their license. It's really, and I know they're working very hard on that. Tell me about the telehealth. Um, are, are you going to continue with that? Uh, from here on in? Is it something that has That's the plan. The insurance momentum? companies see the benefit in the telehealth. Before they were fighting it, they didn't want to, they wanted to do away with it October the 1st, but we were able to show the numbers of, look how many people are actually showing up to their appointments versus right. when you make them come in person, they're not okay. showing up. They're just, mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, people got to work. People got to do different things. It's easy, much easier for a person to go outside or to go into not the restroom, but to go into a meeting room at their job and have their appointment and then go back to work versus driving X amount of miles to come to an appointment and sit and wait. So, is the, do you, Are the outcomes the same through telehealth as it is on one-on-one? -on -one? Is there, has been, there been a... We have better measures as far as no-show numbers. No-show numbers, but... Are, we have less no-shows with the telehealth. Uh, we believe it's because the clients are reticent to, to come in for appointments with COVID or for the travel reasons. But are their outcomes better? Are their, the, your clients' outcomes better or the same? Well, so far, the outcomes that we've measured to this point are similar. 
Okay. There is not a drastic difference. Yeah. There's only a drastic difference so far from our numbers on the no-shows. Okay. Yeah. I, think, I think they're going to need time to really come up with those statistics, statistics because telehealth now is becoming mm. a big way of being get, to get people seen, whether it's with a psychiatrist or whether it's with their, any other kind of a, a physician. So I think we have to see those statistics down it the road. It appears that mental health is really where it has boomed. It really yes. Does. yes. yes. And you know it's better to have somebody that you can see and talk to than nobody at all. That's right. We do have a lot of clients that are unhappy. Some of the comments we did get on our satisfaction surveys were that they really liked our telehealth services. They liked the phone calls. They liked the phone calls. They liked the phone calls. They really liked just the phone call, which is not necessarily the best, best for them. But a lot of clients like just the phone call, and when the insurance companies stopped paying for the phone calls, and the managing entity said we're, we're not going to be paying for phone calls, it has to be video, yeah, or face to face. Yep. So that was a little challenge, you know, getting them to understand that. Um, uh, the other challenge is a lot of the clients are not always, you know, great with the telehealth with the zooms, mm -hmm. and, you know, the sessions. So we have to walk them through, which takes extra time. So there's there's been a lot of challenges there. Um, but we are finding that they, they really do like having that option of, of either or. Were you ever given any funding to provide, a, uh, to provide technology uh, to the clients? Did the state ever come down with dollars for that so that they can be helped at home for those who... We've gotten, do we've gotten different dollars and different grants at time. Um, we worked with uh, Lisa Reimer, had gotten uh, some iPads for some of our classes for the classroom environment mm -hmm. from some of our clients. Um, but we haven't gotten a specific technology grant at this point, specific to telehealth. Any other questions for them? No, thank you. No. Thank you. I, I Good luck, I both of you. It's going to continue to rise. I mean, that's yeah. from everything that everybody says. It's going to continue. So, Good luck in your search for a, a psychiatrist, psychiatrist <laughs> for thank children. You. Thank you yeah. so much. Okay. Is there any unfinished business with the trustees? Any new business? Any other business? Monkey. <laughs> any public comment? No public comment? Then we are adjourned for the month. Okay. Have a happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Yes. Enjoy your time and hopefully enjoy your families. <laughs>